Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, live webinar again. Today's topic is going to be our Kubel's Google Cloud support and how we are able to enable you to simplify today and to future proof for tomorrow's big data challenges. Uh, I am David Stewart. I am joined today by Arpan Roy. We have uh, many attendees kind of coming in, so we'll give them another minute here. Then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, well, so welcome everybody again. My name is David Stewart. Uh, today's webinar session is gonna be on Google support for Google Cloud for solving today's and simplifying tomorrow's future-proof big data challenges. Today I'm joined uh, with Arpan Roy, one of our lead solutions architects. He's actually going to be walking through uh, the platform, giving you an overview of how we support Google's GCP environments or our customers. And then we're going to have a Q&A session afterwards. So please go ahead and start submitting any questions you may have throughout the presentation. We'll go ahead and address those at the end. So for today's demo, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a quick high-level introduction on Kubel. Then, as I mentioned, Arpan's going to take you through the platform. And then uh, we'll open up to Q&A. So. So Kubel, at a glance, uh, was founded in 2011 by some actually co-creator authors of Apache Hive, started at Facebook, and then decided to go out on their own and, and then build Kubel, which is a data platform that supports multiple engines, um, Presto, Hive, Hadoop, HDFS, as well as uh, Airflow as a service. We've had huge market success by providing this platform for multiple customers who are actually processing large amounts of data each month. Um, and where we lead in is a being able to provide a multi-cloud, multi-engine support, and then driving down cost avoidance by being able to leverage, you know, preemptible virtual machines, uh, being able to bring down and scale up clusters as needed, and then being able to offer variety of ways of managing and monitoring your cost governance in the cloud. Kubel is a recognized leader as an innovator by some of the marketplace from end user reviews, as well as uh, being able to recognize where we can offer multiple platform support. And IDERA is acquired Kubel in 2020 to actually fulfill their data fabric story. Um, we're joined with different technologies such as Aqua Data Studio, uh, ER Studios, Wearscape for data warehouse automation, and then Kubel rounds it out for the data lake support for being able to offer components for building data pipelines, ad hoc streaming analytics, machine learning, and then AI on any work clouds. Next slide. So for right now, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Arpon. He's going to go ahead and take you through the platform. Arpan. Hey, thanks, David. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Arpan with the Solutions Architecture team here at Kubo. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about analytics with our modern data lake platform at Kubo. Uh, this will be a quick conversation about a new way of thinking about analytics in a data lake environment and a little bit of a discussion about the simplification of <clears throat> overall data infrastructure and cost. So um, yeah, if you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so just to set the stage, we know that data is extremely important. And as data specialists, which many of you are, we understand the value data brings to a business. But I think it's really important to know that in times of disruption, uh, particularly in terms of maybe financial disruption and, and the pandemic going on, uh, that data can make the difference between success and failure for a business. So particularly in times of disruption, insights uh, from data can help organize, survive, and even thrive during change. And as data people, we, organ we, we help organizations understand the value they can receive from the data that they have. But we know that every business does not do this. So, and uh, personally from talking with a, a lot of data-driven businesses, the challenge really is with balancing the time spent on infrastructure and delivering what is currently available to the business every single day. 
also at the same time while innovating, which is uh, a very, very extreme um, uh, hard challenge. So now this innovation versus <clears throat> infrastructure challenge is a really severe one for a lot of people uh, after speaking uh, personally, after speaking to them. And most organizations that I talk with spend around maybe 60 to 80% of the time just trying to keep up with and managing maybe a data lake or a data warehouse or uh, managing ad hoc requests from users. So basically a lot of time is spent just to keep the lights on and that does not essentially give us a lot of time to rethink how our data stack works. So we're really challenged with figuring out what we need today and meet these new opportunities for data in our business. Um, with that being said, I'd like to share some of the uh, I'd like to share some of the uh, the options that I have. Uh, so, so some of the features that we have are um, in terms of cluster management. At uh, a bit about Kubel. Uh, so our team has worked hard to alleviate the infrastructure challenge. Um, a bit more about our platform, uh, as David had already mentioned. So Kubel is a platform that provides big data as a service on, um, on the cloud. Our platform caters to several use cases, such as machine learning, streaming analytics, data engineering, and data exploration that serve the needs of several different personas, be it a data engineer who is interested in a SQL, SQL style workbench, a data scientist with an appetite to code, or even a data administrator taking care of resource management activities. Uh, if, if you can go to the next slide, David. Right. So what? right now, let's dive a little bit deeper into how the Kubel platform operates. So what you see right now is the architecture of the entire Kubel platform. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, I will try to read the slide from the right to the left. So to the right, you will see the customer's cloud account, which is uh, primarily GCP here. I would say we have gained significant traction in GCP. Uh, we have a couple of customers, uh, including Priceline.com, which uh, one and uh, which uh, significantly use compute storages in GCP. So they have the data sitting in an object store, uh, uh, an, an object store in this case Google Cloud in Google Storage, or maybe in a data warehouse or, or an on-prem that may or be may not be part of the GCP account. So customers have their data, have their compute clusters coming up in a private network known as a VPC or virtual private cloud, as most of you know. Um, they have their Metastore in their cloud account as well. Uh, in Kubol, the, the box on the right that we see right now is uh, the entire section is known as the data plane. And for security reasons, data does not move outside the, of their cloud account. Uh, when you move to the left, you see what we call as the control plane. And uh, the platform takes advantage of all the cloud native properties, such as elasticity, and those built entirely in the cloud. Um, on the on the left of that, I'm sorry, it, it's been inverted. So on the right, you would you would see what is called as um, uh, you, the different ways that you can integrate with the Kubel platform. Uh, the data, as it is in hosted entirely into, in AWS, we uh, we take advantage of all the cloud native properties. Um, so the data plane is elastic and integrates with some of the best open source engines that I mentioned earlier. Um, some of them being Hive, Spark, and Hadoop. Uh, recently, we have uh, released uh, an offering with uh, that provides you with Spark 3.0 as well. Uh, on top of that, we provide Presto for ad hoc latency, low latency queries, and to manage your workflow orchestrations, we provide Airflow. So we, on top of this, for your Hive, we also provide a multi-tenant Metastore for customers that do not have their Metastore. Um, early customers who are generally new to the cloud and are looking for sort of an early data lake adoption generally tend to use this Metastore, but uh, in term, but our more established customers have their own Hive Metastore. So on the right, you can see uh, the different ways you can interact with the Qworld platform. Uh, the UI, the APIs, SDKs written in Python, Java, and Ruby, or ODBC and JDBC connectors as well. So one thing that I wanted to make sure is that people don't install Kubel. Um, you, all you have to do is log in to the website and then create your account and you can already start with your analytics. It's that, it's that easy. So with that being said, so when I when a user submits, so let's look at a little, let's look at how it works in a bit more depth as to how 
how Qbol generates or processes your queries. So when a user submits a query to Qbol, uh, Qbol brings up a cluster online if one is not already to process the command submitted by the user. If during processing, Qbol recognizes that clusters that the cluster that you have generated or specified is not powerful enough to push the job through in a satisfactory amount of time, then Qbol will begin to add additional nodes to the cluster, that thereby bringing online as many nodes necessary while staying within the configuration boundaries that is specified by you. So Qbol can also add additional nodes to the clusters based on the overall needs of the environment and not just based on the user. Since when working inside of the space, you, you may not be the individual submitting the command. So with that being said, yeah, when you bring up a cluster, it will come online inside of your cloud space, inside of your security configuration that you have specified. And uh, all the data is important to know that all the data will stay within the space and within the virtual private cloud directed to the cluster. So any results are also pulled from and written to your cloud storage location. And as a result, all your activity occurs within your cloud and your security configuration. So Qbol does not have any data transfer for the clusters to be successful. And as a result, we can think of the configuration or configuring all of our security settings when working with Qbol. So this can be done with the Qbol configuration if you're an administrator, as well as from the, from the GCP console as well. Um, and there are different access areas of controls that we can exercise. So once the processing has been completed and there are no jobs running within the cluster, Qbol can take the clusters offline so that you are not spending money on resources that you are not using. Uh, we can also decrease the overall size of the cluster if the collective demand of the user base is no longer demanding the processing power of a large cluster size. Uh, we can deploy the clusters inside the cloud, offering Spark, Hadoop, Presto, or of the HBase variety, as I mentioned before. And as a result, when it comes to identifying the cluster you want to use in the environment, it is important to keep in mind that Qbol is going to be the cloud agnostic provider. And that is to say that the decision of which cluster to pick should not be based on the features that we offer, but based on the behavior of the particular cluster and how that will stack up to your needs. Uh, in, in, instead of your enterprise or for your particular use case. So to summarize, while working with Qbol, uh, we can rely on Qbol to bring up clusters online in a secure manner, expand the size of it, and based on the user environment, uh, decrease the size of a cluster as your overall workload uh, decreases and ultimately bringing it down where it is no longer being used. Uh, with that being said, I know that it was a lot to digest and I think a live demo would help with this. So if I can... Um, Start sharing my screen, David. Thank you. So this is the Qbol landing page. And uh, over here, you can see a bunch of functionalities that I'll talk about. And on the right, what you see over here is your cloud account, in this case being GCP. Uh, for example, in this case, you can have different accounts at different levels. For example, you can have different test accounts, development accounts, and regular customers that can have separate accounts with different resources as well. So out of the box, sorry. Right, so out of the box, the platform provides role-based access control. And depending on the amount of permissions that you have assigned to a role, the, the user can perform only those activities. Uh, we have the system administrator role that has access to almost all functionalities, uh, such as changing cluster, config con cluster configurations and adding clusters. We have, we have a system user role, which uh, has access to most resources and not all. And finally, the dashboard user that has limited access. So before we talk about some of the options, let's see some of the prerequisite steps that we uh, that, that we need to sort of uh, to sort of connect your Qbol account to your cloud account to your GCP account. So let me show you what happens. So over here you can see a bunch of functionalities. So all you all Qbol needs from you is that uh, is is the is a is a location to store the the logs of your cluster, which is essentially um, uh, the Google Cloud Storage, which you would provide it as an object store as a data bucket over here or in the default location. And another thing that you need in terms of compute is an IAM role. 
and an email address that is a, a, that is associated with your project. Uh, you would also specify the IAM roles that are associated with your GCP project so that Qbol uh, essentially has the permission to create, bring up, auto scale, uh, and submit workloads to the clusters on your behalf. So all you have to do is provide a default location, which is essentially a bucket, and the project ID with your email address. And Qbol will essentially automatically connect to your account. So the entire process takes about five minutes. Uh, so as I would like to go through some of the other options that I was speaking about earlier. So let's start with, this is the clusters option uh, where we where we where where the order scaling takes place. So well, let me go through some of the options that are required to uh, sort of create a cluster. So depending on what you choose, we bring up the right daemons so that the right kind of workloads run successfully, be it Spark, Presto, Hive, or Hadoop. Uh, a powerful feature that we have that Qbol has built on top of on top of the existing cluster management, which, which I think is cool, is that you can uh, submit a workload against a specific cluster label. So, for example, you would define a cluster label on a on a bunch of clusters, and you can drag and drop uh, your certain workloads or query and analytics onto those clusters, and the query would be automatically evenly distributed among your cluster. So the master node type and the worker node type. Uh, you can specify the amount of RAM that you need and the number of executors uh, in specific settings. Um, so, and the minimum and maximum number of worker nodes. This is where you would define the boundaries of your auto scaling. Uh, this is essentially the key feature which allows a Qbolt to control the costs and the amount of costs that you save uh, in terms of uh, while querying your jobs. So it, we, it is important to note that when we uh, that Qbol will not um, Qbol will not um, uh, bring up clusters beyond your auto scaling limit, thereby significantly reducing and predicting your costs at the same time. So another additional feature that uh, we provide that uh, significantly reduces costs is the ability to provide preemptible nodes or spot nodes. So a bit of a primer on spot nodes or preemptible nodes. So they are computers that essentially come at a massive discount for those who don't know, compared to instances that work on demand. Sorry. Yes, that work on demand. And the caveat is that it uh, is that GCP can take away the instances in a short notice. So when, whatever job that you're running can abruptly be terminated or you need to shift the job to another node. So this is a, the marquee feature that we have on top of this is that when, when the marketplace takes away your spot nodes abruptly, we have enough intelligence to try the jobs on surviving nodes. Um, besides this, there are a couple of optimizations that I want to talk about. Some of the key optimizations that Qbol has come up with are based on the generic auto scaling that I think is quite unique. Um, one of them is the spot node rebalancing. Um, one of them is the spot node rebalancing. So for example, if I have a heterogeneous cluster set up with a mixture of on-demand and spot nodes, um, if you have, uh, yeah, the, if the ratio of the running cluster falls short of what you have configured due to maybe unavailability of uh, maybe frequent termination of spot nodes. Uh, so Qbol has actually set up a spot node rebalancer that proactively recovers the ratio that was set up by you thereby uh, again controlling your costs so one thing that uh, all the features that we have in terms of auto scaling have been uh, built to aggressively reduce, uh, reduce your costs in terms of uh, in terms of a query workloads uh, another one is your storage upscaling in qbol we call it the ebs upscaling uh, uh, for example if you have a lot of jobs where there are frequent writes to disk and you are running out of storage uh, so we use the concept of a logical volume manager, which uh, allows Qbol to automatically add uh, elastic block store volumes to the logical volumes and resize the file system. Um, let me see if there are some other options that I want to talk, talk about. Um, these are some of the preemptible nodes. You can specify the the, the percentage at beyond which you, the spot node rebalancer would kick in. Um, right. So over here you can specify the amis for your master node as well so you can set up a higher memory and ram for more powerful nodes in your cluster i will try to skip the advanced section for now in uh, for our for our demo uh, please feel free to contact me so that i can walk you through it 
um, the next feature. So now that you have uh, your account set up and um, and and you have some of the uh, a, a basic understanding of how the clusters work, I would like to show you how your data is connected to from your from your GCP account. So these are some of the other capabilities that I wanted to highlight. Uh, uh, th th which is the explore feature. One of them being is the explore feature where you essentially establish connection to your data. And once this is done, you have a unified, you know, bird's view of your sch schema. So as you can see, I've already gone ahead and done that. I have, uh, I have uh, uh, created a data set in my GCP storage. And uh, essentially I can, I can have, I have a predefined view of my schema over here, as you can see. So I have an e-commerce DB and a bike, a bike valet data set. Which, um, yeah, so I'll, let me go through some of the options briefly. So here's a, here are some of the options that I wanted to highlight. Uh, the, so essentially you have, Kubel offers uh, a, a number of ways to ingest your data so to, or to establish connections to your data. This is where the ingestion takes place in our data lake. Uh, you will provide a data store name and you have a number of options here as well. So you have an Azure, Azure SQL based database, a Redshift, Postgres SQL, Vertica, you name it. You would provide a port and a username and password to authenticate with your store. And and internally, Kubol would use DB Scoop to sort of uh, scoop up your data using from, from Hadoop. And we use a lift and shift strategy to do it as well. Um, apart from this, you have the option to connect to your custom meta store. I've gone ahead and done that as well. Uh, we have a number of options here as well. We have a we have a Metastore database, which essentially is an RDS database, but, and you would provide a specific host address and port to connect to. And once you've done this, you've essentially had a bird's eye view of your schema, and you can run your query workloads against them as well. Um, another feature that I wanted to talk about was the notebooks. So the notebooks are essentially... so. There are two different kinds of notebooks that are popular in the data science world. Uh, uh, one, one is Zeppelin and the other is Jupyter, as most of you have come across. So the UI right now that I show you is uh, Zeppelin, but you can also switch to Jupyter as well, uh, as you can see here. So and uh, right, and you provide the name of the notebook and you would pr proceed. Uh, to, to show you some of the powerful features of our notebooks, I have come up with a customer churn model uh, that uh, that would uh, sort of uh, walk you through some of the machine learning features of uh, what Kubel has to offer in terms of our... Um, so Kubel would offer open source machine learning uh, on top of the existing environments in An Anaconda as well. So any of the open source libraries that are available in Python, which uh, essentially are a powerful feature which are powerful libraries in machine learning are offered by Kubel as well. So you don't need to migrate your jobs and uh, you don't need to migrate your jobs into specific data, uh, specific data libraries while uh, going through Kubel. You can essentially just drag and drop or just migrate your query, uh, migrate your notebooks into Kubel. Uh, the models that I have for you right now, uh, the application essentially is a, cust a customer attrition prediction model. So you might have uh, wondered how you receive like personalized promotions in your email from from large huge telecom giants, and uh, this is basically a direction. I mean, this is basically a result of a lot of them developing a customer attrition prediction model based on a lot of features that you provide them with, based on you know, how you click. So we've essentially mimicked that, and we've done that using Apache Spark. Uh, so the data set that we use right now is taken from Kaggle. Uh, it's for, it's called the Teleco Customer Churn Data Set. Um, which I will go through briefly in some of the later stages. So right now, what you see over here is the architecture of how we have designed the model. So essentially we have data setting in two different sources. So one is in a semi-structured form, maybe in JSON and another in a flat file uh, and, and, uh, and, and RDS, which is a structured format. So we have essentially ingested uh, on the left side, if you can see uh, that we have ingested both kinds of data into, into Spark, which is a distributed in-memory framework that we provide. Um, so once the data has been ingested, we have done the feature selection and basically cleaning of our data to essentially shape it into what we would like to, what we would like it to look like. 
Uh, apart from that, we have done uh, the, the chi-square fe the, the feature selection to find out the important uh, features uh, that uh, essentially correlate to uh, prediction. One being that the customer is at risk of prediction and zero being that the customer uh, is not. So apart from that, we have uh, used uh, very common methods to use uh, to split your uh, training and testing data sets, 70% of which has been used for training and 30% for testing. Uh, there are essentially two models that we have used to, uh, to, to uh, which is used for our prediction. One is the random forest uh, model and the logistic regression that we have used. Uh, another model, that, which is the GBT classifier, is also used, which I will speak about later. So once the prediction has happened, we use the model. We use several model, model validation uh, so, uh, techniques, such as uh, uh, precision and recall, to evaluate the, the accuracy of our prediction. And uh, the, for tuning, we have used the K-Force cross-validation, which, which essentially alternates between uh, development and testing. I mean, uh, testing and prediction. Uh, yeah, so let me briefly walk through how we have done it. So more about the data set. So we have a bunch of uh, fields. I think there were 12 fields. Yeah, and there are around data, uh, around 5,000 data points, some of them being uh, the state, account length, area code. You, as you can see, you can read it over here. Um, so Park is, again, a in, in distributed in-memory framework, which allows you to provide, which provides a lot of um, machine learning capabilities that come in, in the form of Spark's MLlib. Uh, this, so the data ingestion that, that I had spoken about earlier takes place over here. So essentially the entire code is written in Scala. Um, right. So this is essentially where I would do a Spark.read to read from the CSV that I have placed in my GCP storage account. So this is, this is essentially where I would initialize my machine learning pipelines, as I mentioned before, the random forest, the logistic regression, and the GBT pipeline uh, that I added in later. So for feature engineering and selecting the top uh, seven features that uh, that uh, directly correlate to whether a customer is at risk as prediction is done using the chi-square feature test. Uh, this is uh, gen generic feature engineering and that I'm sure most of you have uh, a, a decent idea of. So this ha essentially happens over here. Now this is where the training and testing happens. So the, this is where you, as you can see that we have mentioned the 70% of it has been used for training and 30% of it was testing. Um, yeah, this can be done using very, uh, I mean, regular open source Python libraries as well. Now for our model, model validation and selection, we have used precision and recall and the ROC curve and accuracy uh, just for, uh, just to evaluate the accuracy of prediction in our model. So as you can see, these are all open source libraries that we have used in Scala. And uh, yeah, for, and finally for our, part, um, our model tuning, we have used the K-Force validation technique to sort of uh, split your data to, 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 to sort of increase the, uh, the, the accuracy of prediction in your models. So with that being said, I would like to shift your attention to some of the other optimizations that Qbol has. And uh, besides this, I wanted to highlight uh, so yeah, particularly uh, the the options, I mean, the optimizations that we had in Spark and Presto. So one of them is a federated source of data. So essentially when you're ingesting your data, uh, there are a bunch of connectors out there that just that ju that just connect to, uh, press, to the Presto engine and uh, a data source can be sitting in a NoSQL database, which might also need another corrector. So essentially what Qbold does is that you provide a unified a, a unified collection of your data. So essentially if your data, it doesn't matter if your data is in a NoSQL database or a SQL database or in a flat file. So we ingest all of that in, a, in one single form. And, uh, and this is essentially acts as a federated source of data that is accessible to everybody, analysts, engineers, everybody. So you don't essentially have to submit an IT ticket to sort of wait weeks to gain access to your data. So once your data is inside Qbol, uh, has been established to Qbol, as I'd like to say, uh, your, your data is available to literally everybody in the company based on the role-based access that you have provided. Um, another is uh, join reordering and dynamic filtering, which is essentially on most of our engines. Uh, so in our Spark SQL and particularly in Presto, uh, we allow you to filter out data that is not lead needed in the later stages of a join operation, which a lot of you use, I know. Um, so this allows you to produce a lot more results quicker. 
Uh, we also have uh, our own lightweight data caching framework to store to store of the uh, store in intermediate results. Uh, it's called Rubix. So Rubix can be extended to support any engine that accesses data using the Hadoop file system. So, and lastly, due to the strong open source community within the big data workspace, we have a lot of big companies. I know there are a lot of big companies in the Bay Area, like Facebook and Uber, use Presto and Spark and some of the mentioned, uh, some of the engines that we had mentioned, Hive, uh, in a scale that is that goes across 1,000 nodes. And the we know that the ecosystem is very strong, and we can easily integrate any new contribution contributions to our innovations. So an example of this would be Rubix. So Rubix is a pattern from Cubol that uh, that is the caching framework that I've spoken about, and it it has been implemented by I mean it has been used by several other comp uh, companies. So uh, with that being said, I hope uh, you uh, that is that's uh, these are some of the core features that I wanted to highlight about some of the offerings of Cubol. Um, I, I hope you have a decent idea as to how we do it, and I will be glad to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Arpan, for walking us everyone through the, the platform today. So, guys, we're going to go ahead and open up to questions. If you want to go ahead and submit them to the chat panel, we'll go ahead and answer those now. So, does Cubol support an on-prem? Um, yeah, this is from Sanjay. And uh, how does it pull data from Oracle? So essentially, yeah, that would happen from the Explore tab over here. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, you would establish your connections with from your RDS or any Oracle database from here. So as you can see, you are connected through a service name. Um, and yeah, you have, you have a few options to connect to an Oracle on-prem cluster. Uh, I hope that answers it. And it pulls data from Oracle. So once you've essentially established your connection to your GCP account, you will establish a data connection from here. As I've shown before, you provide a port and a host address to your on-prem uh, your, your on Oracle database. And, and you can start uh, on your workbench as you, oh, as, I mean, as and when you choose. So once you've established your connections, we can, you can start over here if that answers your question. So, thank you. Awesome, all right, anybody else, guys? We'll, uh, we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. 